American Contemporary Publication, compiled by Elena W., Avery H., Celeste S., and Emma F. for English 305. Section 1. The Contemporary Publishing House We know that a book goes through many a set of hands on its way to the bookshelf. Once it's written and perfected by the author, the author sends their manuscript to multiple literary agents. These agents decide whether or not the manuscript has the potential to be marketable to a large and diverse audience as a proper novel. If an agent chooses to represent a book, then the agent passes it on to an editor. These editors work for the publishing houses and are responsible for deciding which books are best to publish. Editors, as their name suggests, may also, while working in tandem with the author, make any number of changes to the book before it is printed to make it the best that it can be. It takes years for a story to go from an author's notebook or typewriter or computer to the shelves of your local bookseller. At the end of the day, it is the job of the publishing house to deduce the interests of everyday readers and the trends they create and follow them to the letter. A book could be utterly amazing by one person's standard, but if publishing houses don't choose to back it up, then the likelihood of it coming to your local bookstore is small. Or at least, that was the case until recently. More on that later. And speaking of publishing houses, in contemporary publishing, there are five main publishing house giants. Penguin, Random House, Hachette, HarperCollins, Macmillan Publishers, and Simon and & Schuster. And within each of these houses are several imprints. Imprints being smaller groups within a publishing house that break the major categories up even more based on certain genres or demographics. Some of the more notable imprints are Penguin Classics under Penguin, Little Brown & Company under Hachette, William Morrow under HarperCollins, and Scribner under Simon & Schuster. Within even the past few years, there have been several noteworthy conversations around the world of traditional publishing and the ethics of the publishing house in itself. In 2013, Penguin and Random House merged to make the new and aptly named publishing company, Penguin Random House. In the past few months, a similar merger was proposed between Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster but was denied in the court of law by U.S. District Court Judge Florence Pan on the grounds of avoiding a monopoly. Should this merger have taken place, it most definitely would have greatly multiplied Penguin Random House's income and indeed led to their having a monopoly in the publishing world. Instead, other publishing houses have been assured the freedom to develop themselves further and strengthen their abilities to thrive alongside other competing publishers. However, all this competition between publishing houses is no good if the houses do not adapt to the needs of their most invaluable asset, the workers. Since November 10th, HarperCollins workers have been on strike. They have come together to say that they are not being paid nearly enough for the instrumental work they do, and that this publishing house is not working hard enough to diversify their workplace or their books list. HarperCollins has not budged, however, and so neither have the workers. The strike continues. Who's to say what kind of impact this strike will have on the publishing industry in years to come? Section 2. The Rise of the Modern Bookstore In the 1970s, major chain bookstores began to cement their places in the bookseller industry. Across the decades, we can see chain bookstores such as Crown, Borders, Walden Books, and Zondervan rise and fall in popularity and sales. By the early 1990s, many of these bookstores closed their doors or were bought out by other companies. In the early 2000s, Barnes & Noble and Books A Million became the top bookstore chains in the country and skyrocketed in revenue. These two bookstore chains dominated the industry and were the major source of book sales and a cup of coffee among the general public. However, the reign of Barnes & Noble and Books A Million would not be safe from the challenges of their predecessors. The rise of online booksellers, specifically Amazon, quickly and negatively impacted big chain bookstore sales as well as small independent ones. To increase sales, Amazon often lowered the price of physical books and the new medium of digital ebooks, which ultimately meant that both the publisher and the author would receive less profit from the sale. Amazon even has the power to go as far as to remove the option to purchase a certain author's books if that author tries to dispute the price for which their book is being sold. By offering low prices on books and ebooks, customers are increasingly likely to buy online from Amazon than from storefront booksellers. And on top of that, when the coronavirus pandemic began to swiftly ravage the world in late 2019 and early 2020, businesses big and small were forced to temporarily close to the public. Because people were staying at home for long stretches of time to slow the spread of the virus, there was a stark increase in book and ebook purchases through online sellers, mainly Amazon, again giving them an already steadily increasing upper hand over storefront booksellers. Section 3, The Rise of the Young Adult Genre over the last couple of decades, the term YA fiction, or young adult fiction, has been increasingly used in literature and is now a major category in publishing. 
With the emergence of teen culture after World War II and teenagers becoming consumers, they were now a huge and hugely monetizable demographic that would shift the tide of publishing. The novel that is generally regarded as marking the beginning of YA fiction is S. E. Hinton's The Outsiders, written when Hinton herself was still a teenager and published in 1967. With themes of bullying, peer pressure, and conflicts between socioeconomic classes, The Outsiders was a very early example of a book that genuinely discussed issues teenagers regularly faced, from the perspective of a young person who was, at the time, making her way from childhood to adulthood. 1997 saw the publication of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, launching a cultural phenomenon and introducing YA in a format that is more comparable to today. The New York Times created a children's bestseller list, and publishing events like midnight releases became more common. Harry Potter was also the basis for a boom in movie adaptations with its record-breaking eight-movie franchise. Stephanie Myers' Twilight burst onto the literary scene in 2005, sparking an unexpected frenzy and die-hard fan base. It kick-started the demand for paranormal romance, further cemented the trope of the love triangle in popular media, and saw many imitation works, including fan-made works. More on that later. Finally, the release of The Hunger Games in 2008 introduced scrutiny of social and political issues in YA fiction, introduced a female lead with a plotline outside of romance, though the love triangle certainly was still present, and is associated with dystopian fiction's rise in popularity. Often compared to it is Veronica Roth's Divergent trilogy, set in a similarly oppressive society, as are other dystopian series such as The Maze Runner and The Fifth Wave. Stories describing more realistic settings, such as The Fault in Our Stars and other Jean Green novels, have also done well, along with their film adaptations. As it's always been with fiction for young adults, there is a push for diversity and nuanced discussions of the real-life social issues that teenagers are beginning to learn about, and recent popular works reflect that. The Hate You Give, a 2017 novel featuring an African-American female protagonist, was commercially successful and critically acclaimed. The story was inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement and addresses police brutality in the United States and has been credited with opening up more room for African American voices in the YA publishing world. Though it is difficult these days to write a book for young adults that doesn't feel like a ripoff of another work, perhaps the current atmosphere is not a death sentence for the genre, but rather a demonstration of how it is shifting, which brings us to our last section. Section 4. The Internet. The internet has had an incalculable impact on the world of publishing. One example of its impact is its facilitation of self-publishing. Before the internet, there wasn't much of a recognized way for authors to get their stories out into the world without signing to a traditional publishing house. The rise of the internet very quickly changed this, and as early as 1993, readers saw blogs become a form of online writing. Rob Palmer, the self-described world's first blogger, started a blog for the company he was working for at the time. From this, the world of personal blogging took off. Anyone with the desire could start a blog as it was accessible and easy to do. The most popular types of blog to arise were travel blogs, cooking blogs, and self-help and lifestyle blogs. Authors could quickly and easily update their blog on their own timeline and at their own convenience with nothing to hinder them. With the increasingly widespread use of mobile devices, Blogs became some of the easiest reading material for the general public, and because of this, many blogs began to skyrocket in readership. One of the most popular examples of this is the author and blogger Julia Child. Child's blog, succinctly named Julie and Julia, 365 Days, 524 Recipes, One Tiny Apartment Kitchen, gained a huge following after the start of her blog in 2002. Because her blog already had an established readership, publishers figured that there would be potential for a book and indeed, the demand in itself created a market for books of this nature to be published. In 2003, Child landed a book deal and published her book titled Julie and Julia. And following the success of both her blog and her book, a film adaptation of her autobiography was released in 2009. Child's story is a great example of how an author's self-published work has the power to garner enough following and create enough demand for it to rise to the ranks of traditional publishing. Today's bloggers, even those that do not have a following like Childs can still write and publish their own work without the trouble of a middleman, available to be read by anyone with connection to the internet. Another well-known form of self-publishing that sprung up from the rise of the internet is fan fiction. As the name suggests, fan fiction is fiction written by a fan of an already existing piece of media, such as a book, a movie, or a TV show, 
that is based on the characters or setting of said media. Were you deeply unsatisfied with how your favorite TV series ended and want to write and share your own ending? Now you can. Want to see characters from different franchises hanging out together? There's a fanfic for that. Want to see how your favorite fantasy book characters would act if they worked in a modern day coffee shop? There's a fanfic for that. Want to insert yourself into the world of your desired media and interact with the characters as if you were one yourself? There's most definitely a fanfic for that. Although more recently, fanfiction has also been written about the lives of celebrities and other real life public figures, which will be expanded upon later in this section. The internet created a space where anyone and everyone could upload their fanfiction with the press of a button. Online self-publishing forums, the most influential of which being Wattpad and Archive of Our Own, or AO3 for short, became a way for amateur authors to post their stories whenever they wanted. In the 2010s, fanfiction became much more popular among preteens and teens due to the new reality of more and more young people having access to the internet and the fact that these platforms were completely free of charge. With all these factors at play, these platforms experienced an unprecedented influx of stories to their forums. Works of all kinds were allowed on the websites, and some of them became widely popular. Authors usually posted chapters on a schedule, most being weekly, and popular fanfiction would see an exponential increase in readership as the work continued. It's difficult to ignore the similarities of this to the once popular medium of newspaper serials. There really is nothing new under the sun. Similar to blogging, once popular works garnered much readership and created enough demand, publishing companies would start to take interest in their work. One main example of this is the fanfiction turned novel turned four-part young adult movie series After, which began as a fanfiction based on singer Harry Styles from the popular British boy band One Direction. Anna Todd, the author of After, published her story chapter by chapter on Wattpad, with 70% of it being written from her phone. After her story took off, Wattpad itself reached out to invite her to a meeting with publishers. As a fanfiction, After had millions of views and reads, and as a book, it sold 10 million copies while also making it to the New York Times bestseller list. As a movie, it didn't do too poorly either, racking in $50 million in the box office sales worldwide, although the success decreased with subsequent sequels. Anna Todd is not the only Wattpad success story, and lots of professionally published authors even admit to writing fanfiction in their spare time. Other well-known reads that started as fanfiction are the Mortal Instruments series by Cassandra Clare, which was originally a fanfiction based on the Harry Potter character Draco Malfoy, and The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood, which started as a fanfiction based on Star Wars characters Kylo Ren and Rey Skywalker. Fanfiction allows both amateur and professional authors to self-publish without any restraints, and it has become an avenue for authors to become professionally published. More recently, one of the most influential impacts the internet has had on publishing and readership has been social media. In the early 2000s and 2010s, major social media platforms saw avid readers converge to create their own online communities, such as Bookstagram, the site of Instagram focused on book recommendations and reviews, and Booktube, the site of YouTube devoted to the same sort of content. Within this, certain accounts and content creators began to rise in popularity within these communities, becoming influencers within their small internet niche. Naturally, these influencers had more of a say within their communities, and the books with high praise from them that were featured in many posts tended to see a decent rise in sales. However, more recently, reviews and recommendations on social media play an invaluable role in how a book does directly after it is published. In much more recent years, BookTok, the site of the recently popular social media app TikTok that is dedicated to readers, has quite literally taken the reading community by storm. With the use of an algorithm which curates short-form videos specifically for the user, a feature made popular by the app, TikTok is able to suggest and show users videos that will interest them, and both authors and publishers have caught on to this. Both old and new books have gained success through BookTok. For example, The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller was published over 10 years ago in 2011, but after being much more recently discovered and reviewed and raved about on BookTok, it finally became a bestseller years after its initial debut. BookTok has also had a huge effect on new authors. For example, Olivia Blake's self-published novel, The Atlas Six, was so successful on BookTok, she was signed on by a publishing company who released a newly revised version of her book. The use of algorithms on social media to curate content to its specific viewer has changed the marketing world for books, 
and social media in general has irrevocably changed the process of publishing and selling literature for good. It's effectively made consuming literature, both digital and physical, in style again. As the era of American contemporary literature and publication continues into the foreseeable future, we must all remain on our toes and adaptable in this exciting and ever-changing world. Thanks for watching.